We're here in the lab today talking about robust australopithecines, and I've brought in a lot of cast materials and some real osteological materials from humans to compare those two. We're looking at materials from East Africa and South Africa in this lab. We're looking at some materials from Kenya, especially on both the east and west side of Lake Turkana. We're also looking at some materials from Swartkrans, a site that we visited in South Africa. There are other robust Australopithecine sites, and the materials that we have here on the table represent a time span as early as two and a half million years ago, and as recent as after 1.4 million years ago, although the date of that final appearance of robust Australopithecines at Swartkrans is a little bit uncertain. I want to start talking about robust Australopithecines by talking about the ways in which they're obviously different from humans. When we look at a robust Australopithecine skull, you can see that it's pretty distinctive relative to what a human skull looks like. Just a quick look at the human skull shows us that we have a very rounded skull where the jaw muscles in a human skull are on the side of our skull. You can feel those jaw muscles right here on the side of your skull. If you sort of grind your teeth or make chewing motions with your teeth, you'll feel the temporalis muscles on the sides of your skull moving underneath your fingers. Those muscles attach right to the side of the human skull. We also have masseter muscles that attach underneath of our cheekbones. They attach here underneath your cheek. When we look at a robust Australopithecine skull, you'll see that there's a crest that runs right down the center of the top of the skull. That crest is called a sagittal crest. And the sagittal crest is the point of attachment of those same jaw muscles that in humans attach on the side of our skull. In these robust Australopithecines, it goes all the way up from the jaw, attaching all the way along the top of this skull. Those are really big, powerful muscles in these individuals. The masseter muscles, which attach to the front of the face underneath the cheekbone, are similarly large. You see this big scar on this skull that attaches those masseter muscles that help to chew powerful side-to-side -side grinding chewing. Those are the major ways that the robust Australopithecine's jaw musculature is different from humans. But in the human skull, we also have a much bigger brain. Humans, our brain size is, on average, around 1,400 cubic centimeters. These robust Australopithecines range in size from around 400 cubic centimeters up to as large as 600 cubic centimeters. So a little bit under a third the size of the average in living people. When we look at robust Australopithecines compared to humans, the biggest difference that we can observe is in the size of the teeth. And it's a tremendous contrast. When we look at a human skull, we're gonna see that these have the same number of teeth as robust Australopithecines. We have three molar teeth, two premolar teeth, one canine, and two incisors in each quadrant of our jaw. The robust Australopithecine is the same. But when we look at a robust Australopithecine's dentition, you'll see that the molars are tremendous in size. In the largest specimens, those molars are as large as, in the United States, a quarter coin. They're really huge. In contrast, when we look at the front teeth in a robust Australopithecine, they're very small. They have tiny little incisors and tiny canine teeth compared to the immense size of their molars. This is a very distinctive adaptation in their dentition. It's one that's different from humans, and it's also one that's different from other living apes. For example, when we look at a chimpanzee's dentition, we'll see that they have the same teeth three molars, two premolars, one canine, and two incisors. But like the human, the chimpanzees have relatively small molars and premolars. They have much bigger canines than either robust Australopithecines or humans do. They also have big incisors. A robust Australopithecine is very distinctive in the shape of its dentition. Now when we look at other kinds of living apes, we do see contrasts between apes of different body sizes and different diets that give us some clues about what's going on with the robust Australopithecines. For instance, if we look at 
a male gorilla skull, what we'll find is they, like robust australopithecines, have a sagittal crest. They, similarly, have very large temporalis muscles. They also have really large masseter muscles. All of those things make for powerful chewing in the gorilla. What's different between a gorilla and a robust australopithecine is that gorillas weigh nearly three times as much as robust australopithecines did. There is a huge contrast between gorillas, chimpanzees, large and small apes in terms of body size, and that contrast is played out in the shape of their jaw musculature. When we look at australopithecines who have different jaw musculature, australopithecines like this Australopithecus boisei skull and this Australopithecus africanus skull, we see that they're really different in their jaw musculature. However, these different kinds of early hominids are not really different in body size. All of them are much smaller than living people. All of them are approximately the same body size as male chimpanzees. That body size is constant between these different australopithecines. What's different is their dietary adaptations. The first robust australopithecines that we know about are around two and a half million years old. And when we begin to explore their variation, some of that variation is related to the time that we found them. So for instance, this skull is from the west side of Lake Turkana in Kenya. It's about two and a half million years old, and it's become known as the black skull because the fossil itself is darkly stained with, with a manganese that makes it very dark colored. This skull, you can see, has a very small brain. It's, only, it's among the smallest in any robust australopithecine. It's around 410 cubic centimeters. It has a very sloping face, and yet, although the teeth are missing, you can see from the roots of the teeth, it has the classic pattern of incredibly large molar teeth, large premolar teeth, and very small canines and incisors. Later crania in East Africa show the same characteristics, but with some slight variations. So when we look at this skull, which is probably the most famous skull of Australopithecus boisei, this one is called OH5, it's from Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, this skull, in contrast to the black skull, has a relatively vertical face. It has changed the orientation of that skull so that the jaw muscles are exerting more power in the posterior part of the dentition, and the face is protruding less forward. Everything about this skull and everything about the other skulls that belong to the later parts of Australopithecus boisei are built to maximize the powerful chewing in the posterior dentition. They're made for grinding in those premolar and molar teeth. Given that those adaptations are so obvious, we can ask an obvious question. What were they chewing? And this is something that's very interesting because when we look at the different kinds of robust australopithecines, we'll discover that the stable isotope evidence and the evidence of molar microwear on their teeth are telling us a diversity of things about their diets. So for example, if we look at the South African examples of robust australopithecines, we'll find a number of specimens from Swartkrons very much like this one, the most classic one, SK48. SK48 contrasts with some of the skulls of Australopithecus boisei from East Africa in that the molars are quite a lot smaller. They still have an expansion of that molar size compared to other kinds of hominins, but it's not as extreme as in the East African form. For this reason, Australopithecus robustus from South Africa is recognized as being something different from Australopithecus boisei. We see that difference reflected in the chemistry of their bones and teeth. When we look at the chemical signatures of stable isotopes, particularly the stable isotopes of carbon that we see in the teeth of these specimens, we find that there's a big difference. These teeth of Australopithecus robustus are like the teeth of other early hominins, in particular the teeth of Australopithecus africanus, 
in the composition of C3 versus C4 plants that they ate. They ate a fraction of C4 plants, but a fraction that didn't exceed around a fourth or a third of their diet. By contrast, the East African forms that we've got stable isotope data from have a much, much higher concentration of C4 plants in their diet. It's not yet clear exactly what they were eating, although one hypothesis is that they're eating the edible parts of papyrus, a large grass that grows in natural marshy contexts in East Africa. There are lots of edible parts of these plants, lots of bulky things. They're high in fiber, but they're also high in energy content for a hominin that's willing to spend a lot of time pulling them up, processing them, and chewing them. What's interesting about the robust Australopithecines is that these contrasts in what they were eating, a generalized diet in the case of Australopithecus robustus, a more specialized diet, it looks like, in the case of Australopithecus boisei, those contrasts are occurring among different kinds of hominins that have a very similar craniodental adaptation. They look like they're built to chew the same stuff. This is a bit of a problem, and it's led to two different kinds of questions related to the relationships of these hominins. Are they the same kind of thing? They clearly look, in a lot of ways, like their relatives. They both have large jaws and teeth. Their jaws and teeth are both expanded in the same direction, although not to the same degree. And they both have jaw muscles that are really specialized compared to humans and other early hominids. It looks like they could have come from a single ancestor that had a new way of living. Anthropologists who view them as being close relatives call them a different genus from other early hominids. They call them paranthropus. In contrast, we could look at the anatomical similarities of these different kinds of early hominids, the similarities in the sizes of the jaws and teeth, as similarities that are convergent, different kinds of hominids coming from different ancestries doing similar kinds of things. That kind of convergence wouldn't be the first time in the hominin fossil record. And so the relationships of these are not yet entirely clear. Many anthropologists continue to call them Australopithecus robustus and boisei. Others call them Paranthropus robustus and boisei. So what's the big idea about the robust Australopithecines? They are not human ancestors. When we look at the fossil record during the time they lived, two and a half million to one and a half million years ago, there are other hominins that are much more similar to humans than the robust Australopithecines are. Whether they went off in one direction together or went off in the same direction separately, each of them represents a side branch of our evolutionary history. That side branch is really interesting because it tells us a lot about the adaptations that were possible for bipedal hominins in the time that Homo, our genus, was originating. They're specializing on dietary sources that are different from the ones that early Homo is specializing on. They're living in an increasingly dry, increasingly grassy environment and finding new ways to live in that environment until ultimately, sometime after 1.4 million years ago, they became extinct. We don't know yet what causes led to their extinction, but there's every chance that it's competition with other animals, maybe including humans, that led to their end. 